Hi, everyone. Good evening. My name is Michelle D'Amico, and I'm the Director of Continuing Education and Public Programs at the NYU SPS Center for Global Affairs, or CGA. We're so delighted that you could join us this evening to celebrate the great accomplishment of the book launch of The Future of Global Affairs, written by CGA's own faculty. Since its founding, our goal at CGA has been to prepare global citizens to make a positive impact in the world. We do this through our two graduate programs, one in global affairs and our recently launched MS in global security, conflict and cybercrime. We also offer a variety of professional and personal enrichment courses in the areas of global affairs and fundraising. And this includes several professional certificates. And we also host free public events such as this that expand upon the critical issues and timely topics that we cover in our classrooms. We will send out a follow-up message to all attendees, so please feel free to reach out to us with any questions you may have about these programs. We've also reserved some time at the end of today's event for questions from the audience. Please submit your questions via the Q&A tool. And now I am honored to introduce you to Dean Susan Greenbaum, Dean of the NYU School of Professional Studies, who's provided a video to open tonight's event. Thank you, Michelle, for the lovely introduction. And also thank you to Associate Professor Chris Ankerson for the invitation to speak with you this evening. It is my great privilege to recognize the outstanding contributions of the faculty of the Center for Global Affairs with their collaboration on this very important and relevant manuscript, The Future of Global Affairs, Managing Discontinuity, Disruption, and destruction. This past year has been a year unlike any other for those of us in higher ed, not only as educators, but as people suffering through what can only be said as one of the worst humanitarian crises of our lifetimes. Yet if the COVID-19 pandemic has taught us one thing, it has taught us that we live in a highly interconnected world. We have been made to have many individual and personal and local sacrifices in our fight against the disease, but we are not alone. There is virtually nowhere in the world that has not been impacted. Global affairs, the study of interactions between states, intergovernmental organizations, multinational firms, civil society, and individuals on a planetary scale has therefore never been more vital. We're faced with growing uncertainty. How will we meet the global challenges now facing us all? Trillions of dollars and years of economic growth have been erased, reversing the progress of the last few decades. Of course, the impact of COVID has not been distributed equally. Racialized and marginalized peoples have been disproportionately affected, not just in the developing world, but here at home too. The COVID fatality rate for Black Americans is nearly double of that of whites. And for Native Americans, it is two and a half times larger. And Asian Americans have suffered from discrimination and violence across the United States. Women's double day has meant that they have been affected by unemployment outside of the home at nearly twice the rate of men as they have been relied upon to provide child, elder, and home care. All the while, Quite unrelated to COVID-19, the crisis of climate change has not stood still. Neither have international tensions between rival states played out now in real and virtual domains. Human rights abuses have continued apace with the military junta in Myanmar, only the latest example of how democracy is in retreat around the world. And in the face of all of this, the multilateral system epitomized by the United Nations has struggled to respond effectively. 
hampered by sovereignty first approaches of many of its key member states. The timing of the future of global affairs, managing discontinuity, disruption and destruction, therefore could not be more appropriate. As we will no doubt hear this evening, it's attempts to come to grips with what tomorrow's world will look like is something we're all waiting to hear. It will touch on everything from the need for an empirical basis for our decisions to the value of transformative education and peace building, to the promise of feminist foreign policy, to a new normal in the field of global energy, to a new purposeful approach to capitalism. This volume produced by SPS's CGA faculty takes a bold step into the unknown. Not everything they predict will come true, of course, but I congratulate each of them for their accomplishment in sharing their insights with us. Thank you all for joining us as this august panel of experts discuss the volume's main themes. Of course, as good as tonight's session will be, it is no substitute for actually reading the book. And I hope all of you will pick up a copy today. Thank you so much, Dean Greenbaum, for setting the stage for tonight's conversation. I would now like to introduce our moderator and panelists. James Traub is a senior fellow at NYU's Center on International Cooperation, or CIC. He is a journalist and scholar specializing in international affairs and he's also a columnist and contributor to foreignpolicy.com. He has worked as a staff writer for The New Yorker and as a contributing writer to The New York Times Magazine. He's written extensively about national politics, urban affairs, and education. Among his recent books are The Freedom Agenda on the American Policy of Democracy Promotion and The Best Intentions on the UN Under Kofi Annan. And now for our panelists, Corey Shockey is the Director of Foreign and Defense Policy Studies at the American Enterprise Institute, or AEI. Before joining AEI, Dr. Shockey was the Deputy Director General of the International Institute for Strategic Studies in London. She has a distinguished career in government, working at the US State Department, the US Department of Defense, and the National Security Council at the White House. She is also taught at Stanford, West Point, John Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies, the National Defense University, and the University of Maryland. Richard Wolf is a best-selling author, journalist, and digital media executive with an extensive experience covering politics and foreign policy across multiple platforms. He currently writes a weekly column for The Guardian focusing on US politics. He is also very much to our delight an adjunct faculty member and on the advisory board here at CGA. Due to some technical difficulties during the live event, um, we did lose some footage of the beginning of the event. So we are now going to jump into the conversation. Thank you again for joining us. I suppose, you know, the, the, um, the kind of happy, you know, thought there would be the United States and a few other countries have so wildly overbought that they will come to a point hopefully not too long from now, when they can begin to shower these excess doses wow. on countries that need it and can get a, uh, you know, a kind of reputation for, for generosity. So, uh, Corey, I guess the kind of broader question goes back to my Biden-Trump question, which is um, how much of an kind of exit from these problems do you think that wise American leadership could produce? What problems exactly are you talking about? Well, uh, I, I was still ahead. down the rabbit hole of disagreeing with Richard uh, that we were wrong to buy vaccines for all Americans um, and that the model that produced in Great Britain and the United States and other experimental countries um, was somehow doing a disservice to others. Well, that's a good question, Richard. I mean, is that, would you <laughs> argue, let's say Scorey's raised this, let's, let's have this one out. Would you say, Richard, that that thing you described, this kind of hoovering up, uh, was an act of kind of 
you know, uh, international uh, self-aggrandizement, which sets a bad model for the world, or actually is just, you know, what you do when you're the, the leading country to, to create and produce these things. So I do think that if we have a model of leadership moving forward, there is a, you can't just have self-interest, you need to have enlightened self-interest. And I don't think it's particularly enlightened to take up so much vaccine that we will have, in about a month or so, we're going to have so much supply of vaccine that we will find it hard to find people who are enthusiastic to take the vaccine. Our challenge starting somewhere around May is likely to be, not my view, but public health officials, that, that we can't get enough people to, to line up. Will we give it to COVAX now. then and, and come out looking good? All right, but what we have done is delay delay the situation where the rest of the world can get vaccinated. And through that period, more variants are cropping up and then coming back to us, not very in line in our own self-interest, that we are allowing the pandemic to spiral out of control elsewhere because people travel, right? So unless we have completely closed borders, it's not a great policy in any terms other than to say, we are the most important, we will look after ourselves, but of course, the pandemic shows we are deeply interconnected. There aren't really borders, we understand them. And so, I, 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 yes, I understand the sentiment, but if you are going to be uh, the leader of the world with a security and uh, uh, umbrella and a sort of benevolent rule for the rest of the world, then you do have to take a more equitable position on vaccine that at least lives up to your rhetoric. And we have, I don't just mean the United States, Western powers in general, have singularly failed to live up to this idea of, well, we need to treat it everywhere. We're saying we'll treat it everywhere, but once we have dealt with absolutely everyone we can find, and we'll still have a, about 100 million doses too many. So Corey, without necessarily you know, returning to this argument, though you feel free to do so if you wish, the kind of broader question is, uh, I suppose one, is Richard Wright in saying that not only having values, but quite publicly expressing them and expressing them through your policy matters in terms of global leadership. And then I return to my Biden question. Uh, Do you see that his very different form of leadership could mean that some of the problems that we are reading about in this volume will prove to be more soluble than they might appear to be? Yeah. Um, So... Yes, values are hugely important, and they're important for two big reasons for the United States. First, values are the only way you can persuade Americans to care about the rest of the world. Um, If you track public attitudes about any American foreign policy action, you know, there's a reason Henry Kissinger couldn't win an election, right? Because arguing that this tough-minded, Uh, you know, hard-hearted realism is the only way to protect our interests um, is not something, well, as as Peggy Noonan wrote it, the average American dislikes the smell of sulfur, right? (laughs) Um, And so- Hugo Chavez said when he came to the UN? (laughs) The the truths we hold to be self-evident aren't simply American. There are ways we Americans think about the world. And for as much as we fail them domestically and internationally, they are a standard to which we can hold ourselves and others can hold us. And that matters, not just for bringing Americans to care about the world, but because we have values we can be held to. Um, It also makes American power a lot more amenable and attractive to others. If we are nothing other than our power, then there's much less reason for people to help us achieve what we want to achieve in the world, to think that what we are trying to do can be consistent with what they want to do. So yeah, values matter both for our domestic compact and for the effectiveness of our international order. All right. Um, I'm sorry. Go ahead, were you gonna say something else? I was else? just gonna say uh, the third part of your question, uh, which is, yeah, the nice manners and not being a jerk um, is a good recipe for being the leader of the international order. 
and and President Biden's graceful kind of small state politics are dialing down the temperature in the United States and making it easier for countries to cooperate with us internationally. So it is making problems much more soluble. Okay, so so listen, I think now it's it's seven o'clock. So this has been a fabulous conversation, but we have to now give our two co-editors uh, a chance. Uh, and so Christopher uh, and Sidhu, um, uh, please m m magically make yourself appear. Uh, thank you so much. And so before I ask you anything, you've been sitting patiently because it's been forced upon you. Uh, hearing your the book you co-edited talked about. So I would just first like to hear, you know, whatever reactions you have to what uh, Corey and Richard have said. So Sidhu, would you like to begin by saying something? Um, thank you very much for that, uh, Jim. And, and many thanks uh, both to Corey and Richard for this uh, very insightful uh, perspective on the, on the book already. And, and uh, there are two or three issues that I think I'd like to uh, pick up on. The first is, uh, you know, uh, Corey's very astute uh, recognition of the absence of muddling along. And I'm going to try and defend uh, the, you know, the absence of that for a couple of reasons, one of which Jim has already mentioned. Number one, there's no elegant way of saying muddling along, uh, you know, and that's, I think, the challenge. Uh, number two, a colleague of mine and an author in the book, Michael Oppenheimer, would definitely beat me up if I said uh, that, you know, we would, we would use the term muddling along because it gives the impression that we're kind of stumbling along without any um, clear notion of the or direction where we want to go, which is indeed not the case. And, and this brings me to the third point. In fact, if there was an elegant way of saying muddling along, then it is absolutely correct that the powers that be are trying very hard to get through these three alternatives, this kind of you know forks in the road, literally, and see how you might move forward. And uh, Kori Shakya very rightly pointed out that you do see evidence of that. Uh, for example, uh, the very dramatic significant shift from NATO to the Quad. Uh, the fact that NATO is very much an organization in search of a mission, whereas in many ways, the Quad is starting to fulfill the, the needs of a mission which already exists. And the fact that the Quad is really starting to be a combination of NATO plus something like the EU is already a forward movement, quite remarkable in, in, in many sort of ways. Uh, the, the second thing uh, you, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll flag and say is something that Richard Wolf talked about is that, you know, and very rightly pointed out that we saw three decades of discontinuity or disruption. Welcome to the new normal. There's not going to be a decade in the future which is not going to be equally disruptive or have a degree of discontinuity. We just don't know what it is. And we're very ill prepared for that as well. And this brings me to the third and last, uh, last issue. Very briefly, if I might, Jim. Never judge a book by its cover. It's been said, even though this is an unusual <laughs> photograph uh, of the globe at Corona Park. Raise it a little uh, higher so we can see it there. That's better, Steve. Right? Thank you. But, but you can judge a book by its index, or at least doing some kind of you know, word cloud. And there it's very interesting. The, the words which appear the most in the book are the United Nations, followed by the United States and China, and last but not the least, the state. And this tells me something very fundamental. Very often we tend to think of the demise of uh, international organizations or challenges to them as having no impact on the hegemons which led them. If you look at the history, if you look at the concept of Europe and the League of Nations, the demise of the international organization of the day also led to the demise in power sense of the leading hegemon in those organizations. So it's a very risky proposition for the US to, uh, to try and discount that the U it, can, it can do without the UN and still survive as a leading power in the world. 
Uh, Christopher, what was your re- what were your reactions? No, thanks for that. I, I really appreciate the fact that people have uh, have read the book and engaged with it um, so fulsomely. I, I'm not American, so perhaps I'm more comfortable with muddling through. I'm Canadian, and it's kind of what's printed on the back of our uh, uh, coat of arms. Because in some senses, it's it's what middle powers have to do. And maybe what we're seeing now is rather than superpowers versus superpowers, a kind of moving to the middle where middle power muddling through, dealing with circumstances as we find them and trying to turn um, situations into better, to, to the best we can hope for, rather than striking out with a, a grand strategy, uh, is perhaps maybe what we're, we're entering into. And to that end, I think, you know, the, the future is plastic, not elastic, right? It's not going to snap back to some previous state. So um, when we talk about America's back or, or any other country's back, that's true. And it's great to see that there is this appetite for engagement. But in a plastic world, the energy that made the deformations in the first place, some of that, those deformations remain. We've already talked a little bit about the skepticism that other countries may feel after four years of, of Trump. But even some of those trajectories started under Obama, the leading from behind, the uh, don't don't make silly mistakes type attitude. Uh, there's more continuity there than perhaps um, we're aware. So you're entering into a new world with with some old problems and some old trend lines. Uh, Interestingly, and perhaps maybe this is too soon, uh, the the, the honeymoon is still on the Biden administration, but the the democracies, League of Democracies kind of idea is is an interesting one, but not wholly homegrown in the Biden administration either. Um, Pompeo's campaigns in the last months of his uh, tenure as Secretary of State were uh, often framed in this way, talking about a D10, a League of Democracies uh, against the, the autocracy embodied, uh, embodied in the, um, for him, the Chinese Communist Party. So um, it, it, I, I'm not sure we're going to end up with anything but muddling through uh, in the sense that it's very difficult to strike uh, a, a grand strategy with a, with a North Star that, that never changes when reality is you're confronted with these kinds of issues where you need to be uh, uh, making things like the quad, which in and itself, I mean, the quad is an example of muddling through. Uh, it is a temporary, although interestingly, uh, you know, now taking on more dimensions than originally thought. It's a, we know what we're against, but we don't really know what we're for. Uh, it's four countries that have a particular reason to not necessarily want to see the increase in Chinese influence in one particular part of the world. But, um, you're not going to have quads solving climate change. You're not going to have the quad solving uh, inflation or the, or monetary policy uh, uh, globally. So it's not going to, it's going to have to sit beside the G7, the G20, lots of other fora that are going to be used much more functionally, much more uh, purpose driven as opposed to all encompassing. So I think what, what it will look like over time is a lot of muddling through. The, la- the last thing I would say is that, you know, we're, we're really hopefully now seeing that the black box or the billiard ball model of international relations, hopefully now will, will finally be put into the dustbin, right? Um, what goes on inside that state really matters. Whether we talk about personality, we talk about, you know, demagoguery, whatever, what goes on inside these states makes a big, big difference. Uh, and we can cut that several different ways, whether it's ideology, whether it's individual, you know, societal and uh, regime stability, what's going on inside these states makes it makes an enormous difference. And we will have to be more attuned to what that actually looks like, rather than making assumptions, I think, about universal drivers, or even um, my side versus your side drivers sharing some kind of universal affinity that it's just not not the case. Because I think lastly, and perhaps January 6th will 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 kind of stand out for this, you know, identity politics isn't what other people do anymore. It, it we do it as well, where we're afflicted by all of those kinds of things that we used to be certain that other people had to, to see as, a, as an obstacle to to be overcome. Now, I think it's it's humble us a little bit. And I think goes back to this kind of trend, you know, trend maybe that we're all having to act more and more like middle powers now. So Sidhu, I want to go back to the United Nations, which you raised, because of course your your essay in the books about the United Nations. And so what you said to us just now was that uh, the United States ignores the United the, the UN at its peril. But 
the, the burden of your essay is that the UN, what you explicitly say is that the UN continues to have an important role as a convening force. You call that its role as arena, but you say as an agent, it's, it's not. It's, uh, it's possibly not gonna be an actor at all. And so Christopher talked about a bunch of other institutions. You know, Corey talked about the, the role the United States plays as a kind of organizing figure in the world order. And so um, how terrible would it be if the UN continued on its current uh, rather gloomy trajectory? Um, very pertinent point. Uh, and, and I think the way to think about that is that until now, the UN has very much been in the service of the states. Even though its preamble begins with we the peoples, it's very much been about the states and really about the major powers. But we are really at an infl infliction point again for a couple of reasons. Number one, as, as Chris pointed out, you are now seeing uh, middle powers. Uh, and here I would actually include Britain and France in that category as well, uh, as playing a more significant role in pushing forward on some of the norms and actually making the UN operational. Uh, you know, so for example, it comes as no surprise that the first resolution on COVID came from a group of countries in the UN General Assembly rather than the Security Council. And most of these were you know, middle power countries in the classic sense of the word. Uh, number two, uh, there are also new, uh, what, what Andy Knight uh, calls sovereignty free actors who are now uh, you know, in, in the, in the, under the UN tent. Uh, civil society, non-governmental organizations, uh, and indeed corporations. Uh, and the challenge for the UN is to really start upholding the part of its pledge which talks about we the peoples. Uh, it's not designed to do that. It's not designed to look beyond great powers for its uh, kind of approach and direction. But that is certainly going to be the challenge which, which the UN will have to rise to. And I certainly hope it does because it, it definitely has a lot of potential. But, but see, it's true. I'm it's sorry, go ahead. Go it's ahead, also please. true that there are uh, places in the world where the UN is going to be is going to remain central because those are parts of the world that nobody unfortunately cares about. Uh, think of where all the areas where the UN peacekeeping is going on, or in other ways where the UN is providing succor to uh, the poorest of the poor uh, and the most disenfranchised in the world simply because nobody else is paying attention there uh, at, at all. And the last thing I'll say, and this is partly in response to what, what Chris was saying, I think we've also seen an evolution of other multilateral institutions. The G20 did not exist uh, you know, until a few decades ago. It is now uh, you know, the new norm. I would say you know, there's no guarantee that the G7 would continue in its, in its existing form. Indeed, I would argue, uh, and if I was to use a headline, I would say the G7 is dead, long live the G7, which would really be the quad plus three. Mm. Well, so, so Chris, that being the case, I mean, I, you know, I asked Corey about your statement in your essay that we're just not going to be effective at solving global problems because we don't have these instrumentalities. And Corey said, well, we never have. We've had different kinds of instrumentalities. And Sidhu just mentioned a whole bunch of them, including emerging ones. And so should we just think that there will be a kind of, you know, a, a, a very varied architecture of institutions out there to deal with a very varied uh, group of problems. I mean, I think that's true. I think we'll see a lot of, let's call it jurisdiction shopping, where you, you will take a problem to a venue or a fora where you think you can get the best traction possible. And, and clearly, these groups right now, um, in some senses, the less universal they are, maybe the more effective they are in, in that sense. So, you know, there, there is a, a, a drive or a hope, I think, by many that we will see, for example, the United Nations become less state driven and more civil, civil society driven. But I, 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 I feel that that's really going in the opposite direction of effectiveness. Now, we, Sidhu and I have debated this long and hard. It's interesting that we don't agree 
uh, on some of these, you know, issues that are in, in the book. And I think that made it a very fruitful exercise. But right now, uh, if a civil society member or organization or an individual wants to see their um, water carried to the UN, they have to do so through a, a, a state to, to make that happen. So if we're going to make a bunch of new multilateral organizations, like a G7, which is the quad plus three, I think it's really going to depend on who's in it, whether it's going to be useful or not. If you're talking about, you know, there's, there's the dream that could it be quad plus China, for example, doing some kind of condominium. Um, I don't think you're going to get very much uh, appetite to bring things to that kind of a forum. It'll become a bit of a dead end. So the, the affinity of groups, the affinity of the membership of groups, I think to, to a large extent uh, is going to drive these new creations. COVAX, for example, was, was driven out of the fact we needed to create something ad hoc, temporary and effective in light of this big problem that Richard has, has, has you know, brought up of the vacuuming up of, of um, vaccines that was actually, let's be honest, understood before vaccines existed. We knew that this was going to happen even before we had any of the current uh, COVID-19 vaccines. And yet, even though there was lots of agreement at the table, now that the chips are down, it looks like that's not going to be the way it is. And as Richard said, once we're all done, then you can uh, you can come. So I think the uh, one of the problem with institutions is this feeling that you're not that you're somehow going to leave all your problems at the door, enter the institution with kind of you know whatever just goodwill for for the rest of humanity, roll up your sleeves, get the work done, and then leave, and then then go back and be what you were before you came in. But that's not the case. So. The longer term, bigger challenges that the book talks about, climate change, energy uh, renewal, etc. I personally don't think that you're going to see an institution where you're going to get that unanimity and the common perspective on the problem that's going to lead to, uh, you know, uh, anything in anything like a resolution in the in the in the medium term. So let me now turn to our, our viewers who have sent in uh, a bunch of questions for us, and I will, I'll, I'll read them to, I mean, I'll read them out and, I'll, you know, whichever one of you chooses to answer will. So, so uh, one questioner um, says, uh, perhaps the organizational principles will not be centered on government, but on industry. And so we haven't talked at all about the private sector, which is a very important subject uh, in your book. So maybe one of you can address that question. It's a really good chapter in the book. And I thought equally applicable to other civic organizations. Uh, so not just businesses, can play a big role and not just influencing governments, but if you look at how, um, uh, so the United States was actually the first country in 2018 to meet its Paris Climate Accord goals. Despite the Trump administration withdrawing from the Paris Accords, despite the regulatory rollback, despite the overt hostility of the administration, the great golden state of California and Mike Bloomberg's money and Apple computers being super sanctimonious because that's what their that's what their clientele values and my mom wanting there to be um, a better world for her grandchildren. All of those factors combined to produce a United States first passed the post on that. And I, that's what I took away from Christian's chapter as such a powerful momentum force because there's never been a time where there's more space for that to happen. So uh, uh, actually, let me, let me ask you, I don't want to, I want to get as many questions as possible though and that Corey's response raised a lot of interesting issues. Um, so uh, will human rights be on the back burner for global leaders? Uh, is this issue getting in the way for leaders? What are possible ideas for solutions, if any? I mean, I think that's an interesting uh, problem. And, and in a way, as Corey said, you know, values are useful. They have utility, but they're not necessarily the, the trump card that perhaps even a Biden post-Trump uh, world would, would, would like to, to assume. So we look at something like um, Myanmar, small country, clearly the, uh, the coup d'etat, the, the junta taking over, arresting a, a iconic 
although problematic figure like Aung San Suu Kyi causing death every day of unarmed protesters, America has taken action on the basis of human rights. They have done some sanctions, but they've actually kind of you know, stopped short given their concerns about the geopolitical game that China might win some kind of point uh, if Myanmar were to be pushed further into their orbit. So I don't think we're in a new dawn in the age of Aquarius where we can see things all changing. We are really going back to this problem where um, perhaps the last administration was willing to take human rights off the table and in the in the words of, 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 of Secretary Tillerson, not give lectures on them. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to go 180 degrees and be completely driven by human rights concerns at the expense of everything else. Um, we're very much seeing a, an administration saying the right things, being, being guided by those concerns, but at the same time, adding a degree of pragmatism, leaving doors open, and uh, trying to, again, muddle through, in a sense, of, of trying to drive that ball down the fairway without necessarily going to one polar extreme or the other. And Jim, if I may, there's, uh, the, yeah. um, there's a great counterpoint in the book to uh, what I completely agree with, Corey, is an excellent chapter on uh, the future of corporate uh, advancement on, on a whole bunch of leadership questions that Christian Bush writes. The counterpoint is Anne-Marie Goetz's chapter on feminist foreign policy, where one of the first anecdotes is uh, a bunch of Swedish businesses turning around to the Swedish government, the Swedish foreign minister, saying, well, hang on a second, when you criticize Saudi Arabia, you're hurting us, so stop doing that. And she quite uh, uh, elegantly explains how the patriarchy at work undermines the foreign minister and also human rights. So corporate interests can be really positive in moving forward. Uh, human rights often gets left uh, on the sidelines, both for corporate interests and governments, actually. So let me ask a, a, a different question. Looking at the world today uh, versus the world at the turn of the 20th century, uh, many see similarities. And if so, what would prevent a war between great powers from happening again as it did in 1914 and 1939? What would be the most impactful deterrence to war today? Uh, excluding nuclear arsenals, are we moving uh, to war by proxy. So I think especially the broad question there is one that is swirls around in the book, you know, which is the this Thucydides trap, is the United States um, uh, not hurtling to, but somehow stumbling towards war with China or other kinds of wars, you know, India and Pakistan or others. So uh, who would like to take on that one? I think Corey, I would like to hear what Corey has to say about that, yeah, but I will just I'm, add I'm something very short, which Absolutely. is to say yeah. one of the proudest moments of the book is it only mentions Thucydides, I think, three times in the entire volume. So that <laughs> was, was actually- a did, you, did you impose a cap on that one? Well, it came out that There's way. There's but... no such thing as a Thucydides trap. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Thucydides doesn't talk about it that way. Of the top 20 lessons you can take out of Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian War, that a, a dominant power worried about a rising power choosing war isn't in there. What Thucydides talks about um, is weaker allies manipulating strong powers into conflict. That's a more interesting tale, but it's also not the tale of America's alliance relationships. And China doesn't have the kind of deep alliance relationships that would make it possible. Here's my answer to the question about, are we lurching towards war, um, especially war between China and the United States? No, I do not believe we are for a couple of reasons. First, the questioner tries to sequester nuclear weapons out of the equation but you really can't do that. Um, they have been among the strongest powers, a real impediment, a real break against conflict among the strongest powers in the international order. Of course, the uh, data set's very small, uh, but still. Second thing is, you know, uh, the international order was economically as closely intertwined on the eve of World War I as it had been um, through most of recorded history. That economic intertwining did not prevent war between uh, the 
all of the European powers there. So we shouldn't expect it to prevent war between China and the United States. But I do think it's also quite unlikely because first, I think the Chinese know that in the near term, they would lose such a war. And second, because um, I don't think it's in either country's interest to provoke it. It is, I'm gonna call on Sidhu in a moment. It is, to, I wanna defend poor Graham Allison here, who does go oh, to don't. great lengths to say, to say that in fact, China does not engage in war, military war, except as an absolute last ditch uh, 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 maneuver. Otherwise they engage in all sorts of forms of absorption and osmosis. Uh, so, and intimidation indeed. and rule breaking. And, and so those are the things that, that, that are perhaps far more in the offing than this three letter word called war. Anyway, Sidhu. Thank you. Um, I would I would actually agree with 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 uh, with Corey on 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 a, on a couple of points, and I would add one more key element. I think nuclear weapons by themselves uh, have been given too much of magical powers. I don't think they by themselves can prevent conflict. It's the institutions, uh, both bilateral and multilateral, which are designed to manage them that lend to the fact that they're not used. Take a very good example. Uh, you know, we all have this image uh, burnt in our, in, our, in our minds of Khrushchev pounding the podium at the UN. Uh, and that, you know, uh, imagine if the, sub, if the UN was not there for him to pound this podium, he'd probably be pounding, uh, you know, the uh, American cities as the US would be doing as well. So I think one of the things that we tend to underestimate a lot is the ability, particularly of the UN, but other institutions uh, to allow for that kind of space for nuclear armed powers in particular to vent. But there is another element that we still need to be uh, need to be concerned about, and and some of this is mentioned uh, in in the book in, in in other chapters. One of them is it doesn't rule out the possibility of stumbling into war, uh, and it in you you mentioned India and Pakistan. So, for example, you know cross border terrorism. Uh, could well instigate something which may have, you know, uh, which may lead to some kind of a nuclear exchange. So that one one element would be, you know, would be leading leading on to another. So I think that's another aspect that we need to keep in mind. But the other one is the emergence of all these new technologies, artificial intelligence, for example, cyber, which has become the catch-all phrase for everything from lethal autonomous weapon systems to, you know, uh, in fact, now you're also having outer space uh, conflicts, uh, you know, potentially there. This on top of nuclear weapons leads to a new area of uh, absolutely untested, untried deterrence. So either we go back to the classic deterrence that, uh, you know, we were reminded about, which is that nuclear weapons are there only to deter nuclear weapons and nothing else and keep it at that basic level. Otherwise, we're down a very dangerous and slippery slope. All right, well, thank you so much. This has been uh, really, I think, a tremendous conversation. And I now want to turn for, to, for closing words to Dean Vera Yelenek. OK, I've unmuted myself, finally. Hello, everyone. So it is always very difficult to make any sort of profound uh, final remarks, particularly after a panel like the one that you've just heard from which was informative, thoughtful, uh, revealed a lot of things, and, and also introduced some humor, which was very welcome. So I, I'm not going to say very much. I'm going to, quote, muddle along. That's going to be my new phrase from now on. This is a gem of a short book that both reflects each faculty member's passion, commitment, and expertise but is also a testament, I think, to the sort of global, global affairs education that we tried to introduce, and I think we did it in 2004, namely an examination, not of specific functional sectors, but rather the interdependence and interrelationship among them. That is what we meant in those years when in launching we said, our focus in graduate education and, and non-degree education would 
be on a practical, applied, and interdisciplinary approach. There are no cookie cutter solutions in this tome. I couldn't find any, and I'm sure you didn't. Uh, everything's sort of couched with a pro and a con so that you see all sides to an issue. For example, I mean, many of the chapters have been mentioned, but I hope you'll read the book. In the elimination of hydrocarbons, which we all say is a good thing, right? But the question by Karen Kassan is raised as to what the disruptions will ensue for resource dependent countries if that is, is not in the equation. And this is not just one example, but there are examples like this, a sort of weighing of the pros and cons. The contents, I think, also delve on issues that were either not part of the global affairs lexicon, at least not when I was around at the beginning, or did not get the attention that they deserve. Cyber, peace building as opposed to peacekeeping, limited leverage in attaining gender equality and gender biases in political settlements, the militarization of foreign policy, enlightened capitalism, that chapter that, that, that you mentioned that Christian Bush wrote. So we've tried to evolve and to incorporate some of this in our curricula, concentrations in transnational security, peace building, global gender studies were added after the program was established in 2004 and other concentrations were reconfigured and renamed. So in looking on all this, I don't think there's any need to hark back and bemoan the disappearance of 19th century coalitions, Congresses, bilateral treaties, which in the end didn't preclude two world wars, okay? That said, I think, and, and you don't need me to tell you this, I think we're in a revolution in almost every sphere of life with its concomitant discontinuities, disruptions, and destruction. The contributing authors and the two excellent editors whom you've heard from um, expose the forces at play and the possible ways to cope, possible. I dare say that between the time that this book was begun, which was a year and a half ago of hard, hard work, a second volume may be needed to discuss populism, right-wing authoritarianism, uh, the weakening of some regional arrangements, COVID, and more. But for now, I think this is an excellent, an excellent read for all of us. Um, I really need to say a huge thank you Okay, to everybody who contributed. It was meant as a fast trip for me, I think. Not I think, I know. And not least to Chris Ankerson and to W.P. Sidhu, who's always just Sidhu to me, whose phenomenal editing and attention to the production of this volume was above and beyond their teaching and their service to CGA. So I want you all virtually, because I can't do anything else right now, to join me in thanking Corey, Jim Traub, Richard, some, of course, Chris and, and Sidhu. Uh, in some way, you're all part of CGA. So thank you very much.